How likely is it that the LA Rams will win the Super Bowl next year? That's the sort of question you might use the representativeness heuristic to answer. The representativeness heuristic says that you argue that something is likely if it fits your stereotype or past experiences of events like that happening. So will the Rams win the Super Bowl this year? Could be based on past experience. Is a person that you're dealing with trustworthy? Well, have people like this person been trustworthy in the past or in my experience in general, are people trustworthy? I always think of the representativeness effect as being about stereotypes. And you'll see that um, as we go along. Here's an example of the sort of question that researchers use when studying the representativeness heuristic. Let's say you pick a man at random from any place in the US and you find out that that man is slim, short, wears glasses, and likes poetry. Now your job is to figure out what's this man's most likely profession. Is he a university English professor or is he a truck driver? What, do you, what would be your first guess? All right, go with that gut instinct. Well, most everybody has a gut instinct that a man who is slim, short, wears glasses, and likes poetry is a university English professor because it fits our stereotype of what a university English professor would be like. But if we think just in terms of numbers, again, start thinking now with your Spock kind of brain. How many truck drivers are there in the US? Well, there are two and a half million truck drivers in the US. And how many English professors are there in the US? There's 41,000. So two and a half million is huge compared to 41,000. So if I asked you the question, imagine I had a big bowl with red marbles and green marbles, and I had two and a half million red marbles and 40,000 green marbles, and I put them in a big bowl and I mix them all up and I'm gonna pick one at random. Which one am I most likely to pick? Well, obviously, if I have two and a half million red balls, then it's more likely that I'm gonna pick that one out of the container. When there's no psychology in this, we get it right. But when we add psychology, when we add information like, oh, he's skinny and he wears glasses and he likes poetry, all of a sudden our decision-making shifts completely to being a more stereotyped-based decision-making. So while numerically, if you're just looking at the numbers, it's much more likely that a man picked at random in the United States is a truck driver than a university professor, we use the description of the person to determine what's actually most likely. We rely more on the psychology than on the numbers if we're using our gut instinct. This is known as base rate neglect. So what does that mean? If we go back to the example of a big jar filled with red balls and green balls, and I tell you that there's two and a half million red balls and 40,000 green balls, those numbers, two and a half million and 40,000, those are your base rates. And we tend to neglect or ignore the base rates when we're making decisions based on our guts. So for example, you see somebody reading the New York Times, what's the odd that that person has a doctorate, a PhD, or um, what are the odds that the person didn't attend high school? Now, New York Times is considered by many people like the primo newspaper in the US. So most people would assume if you're reading the New York Times that you must have a PhD. But there's very few people in the US who have a PhD and a third of Americans finished high school but didn't go to college. So numerically, it's more likely that somebody reading uh, the New York Times uh, finished high school but didn't go to college, even though our gut says that can't be right because we want to go with the description, not with the numbers. A classic question used to study the representativeness heuristic is something called the Linda the bank teller question, which Kahneman and Tversky used and which you are seeing here. So here's the story. Linda is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. What's more likely, that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? You tell me. What do you think? 
Don't reason it, just give me your gut instinct. Most people say, 65% of people say, that Linda is most likely to be a bank teller and a feminist. Now, I understand that psychologically, but numerically that doesn't make any sense. Here's an example. What's more likely, that there are more students in our class or that there are more students who are left-handed in our class? Well, obviously, there's more students in our class than there are students who are left-handed because left-handed is a subset of all the students in the class. It's the same thing with Linda the bank teller. Uh, the number of bank tellers who are also feminists is gonna be a subset of all of the bank tellers in the world, right? But we pick that subset as thinking it's gonna be more likely. We neglect the base rate again. Here's another one. Let's say there's a hospital in Northridge and yesterday they had six babies born. You tell me which order of baby births is more likely. Is it more likely that A, the first baby born was a boy, the second was a boy, the third was a boy, the fourth was a boy, the fifth was a boy, and the sixth was a boy, or that it was girl first, then girl, girl, boy, 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 or was it girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl? Well, everybody, including myself, says, well, C looks more likely. It does look more likely to us. But if you think about it logically, that makes no sense. Um, no mother's birth is gonna be influenced by the births of the babies before and after her, right? It's not like at the hospital, somebody runs down the hall and says, okay, we've had two boys, the next one needs to be a girl. It's not possible. Um, we pick C because it fits our stereotype of the concept of randomness. C looks random, A does not. And it is true that A is less random if it went on for thousands of trials. But there's something called the law of small numbers. In other words, wonky, strange things happen when you've just got small numbers, like only six um, instances here. So for example, I could flip, flip a penny and get heads six times in a row. And that would be odd, but not impossible. But if I flipped a penny and got heads six million times in a row, that would look weird. Right. There's something related to this um, representativeness heuristic that really bites uh, gamblers. Um, if you like gambling, if you like going up to Vegas, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to this. It's called the gambler's fallacy. My father would fall for it every time. He liked to play uh, 21, blackjack, uh, and he had this theory, like many gamblers, that if he hadn't won in a long time, that he was due to win, he was due to hit. Um, so he would, thinking this, increase his betting. And the more he lost, the more he bet, because he was the gambler's fallacy, right? He was due to hit. Well, we left early a lot of the time um, because it's a fallacy. It's, it's a reasoning error that we all make. We think that something's going to act randomly over the short duration when in fact randomness is over long durations. So we assume that what happens with large numbers, like a million trials, is going to be the same thing that happens with small numbers, like six trials. That's it.